Jam Session is a podcast where two guys who grew up in Dallas-Fort Worth discuss sports, craft beer, life, and their experiences living in one of America's most vibrant cities. If you love sports, you're going to love this show. If you love craft beer or you're curious about it, you'll love this show. Great conversations with good friends is what Jam Session is all about. Welcome. It's nice to have you here. I hope you enjoy it. I think you will. You're listening to the Jam Session Podcast. I was told that I could listen to the radio at a reasonable volume. With Cowboys insider... What's your name? Jean-Jacques Taylor. That's my name. Radio personality and craft beer expert, Matt McLaren. He's a very strange young man. He's an idiot. Comes from upbringing. And now, the Jam Session Podcast... It is indeed Jam Session. Subscribe, rate, and review, and hang out with us for a while. Right here on the Jam Session Podcast. The moment we've all been waiting for has arrived. Ladies and gentlemen, the radio, TV, and now podcast star, the sexy Jean-Jacques Taylor. What up, doll? I would be the non-sexy one, Matt McLaren. And this is Jam Session, the podcast version 44, asking simply that you prepare to be dazzled if not entertained so as we get this thing rolling here on we're recording this on a thursday morning i know many of you will listen to this on friday january 14th why not make this the weekend that you swing by blue star motor group and pick out a new vehicle for yourself or maybe for a loved one as a gift who knows and the cool thing is you can do it all online at bluestarmotorgroup.com we've been telling you about these guys for a while now they're one of our big supporters we're big big fans of what they do because they're local they're family owned at blue star motor group superior quality carfax certified pre-owned vehicles of all makes and models you can give deb a call if you're looking to buy or sell at 817-881-4066 and as always i would encourage you you've got to check out the website because their entire inventory all their pricing all the information on all their vehicles is there on their inventory at bluestarmotorgroup.com also want to tell you about our friend lauren laddick Financial advisor with Edward Jones. Maybe 2021, 2021, maybe 2021 is when you get it done. I just invented a new phrase. 2021, get it done. Edward Jones financial advisor, Lauren Laddick. We're going to have to give her this spot for free now that I completely just botched it. But I was going to say, and, and we've talked about this, maybe this is a year that people are trying to get financially straight, figure some things out after a really screwed up 2020 that's where Lauren can help you, whether you're it's retirement planning, stocks and bonds, investments, 401k rollovers, all those types of things. Edward Jones provides the tools for a reasoned, disciplined approach to investing. And as I mentioned in the last podcast, Lauren is a craft beer drinker. What's better than that? Not Nothing. much. She knows finances. She knows craft beer. Maybe you should know her as well. 972-563-1417. That's 972-563-1417. Edward Jones Financial Advisor, Lauren Laddick. Also, keep in mind that we still have plenty of t-shirts available. So if you are still looking for a Jam Session t-shirt, make sure that you shoot me over your order. You can send me an email, matt at jamsessionpodcast.com. They are available in black or red. We have plenty of large and extra large and 2XL available in black. And I know we have large and extra large in red. We still have some mediums available in red and just a real limited amount of the 3XLs in black. So again, if you haven't gotten your Jam Session t-shirt yet, they're 100% cotton. They're really soft. So shoot me over an email. They're 20 bucks plus shipping and handling to matt at jamsessionpodcast.com. Also, we are continuing to grow our sponsor list for 2021. I've been in a conversation with a couple of you guys about jumping in and helping to sponsor the podcast so that we can keep bringing you new episodes. But if you own a local business, if you know somebody that owns a local business and you would like to get some exposure with us here on Jam Session, again, same emails for the t-shirts, Matt at Jam Session Podcast. So shoot that over to me and we will get you some information on sponsoring the show and joining up with us here in 2021. Love promoting local stuff. Love it, love it, love it. So if you have a local business, again, shoot me an email if you're interested at matt at jamsessionpodcast.com. So let's get this started because this morning I wake up 
as I mentioned, it's Thursday morning when we're recording this. I wake up, I jump on Twitter as I always do. Twitter is basically where I go to see, okay, what happened when I was asleep that I missed? What's the breaking right. news of the morning? That's that's basically my whatever your favorite news channel is, mine is Twitter. <laughs> And Cause it's the world's greatest aggregator, right? I mean, it happens immediately too. And I have a lot of stuff muted, so I don't see a lot of the crap. I, I, I don't really have anything political other than like news sites from a variety of things just to see what's going on in the world. But I wake up this morning and I'm like, what in the world? And I got to say, man, some of you are bringing it to Jacques about the Sarkeesian hire at Texas about uh, all of a sudden Texas is going to be amazing taking shots randomly at Ohio State, which I thought was really interesting. <laughs> but here's the one thing that I love about this. You are so passionate about college football that because you rarely engage people, like somebody could tweet you like stupid stuff about the Cowboys or whatever. And I think right. you ignore a lot of that. But man, when it comes to college football, the passion of your team really comes out. Well, I mean, that's the only team I root for. That's what I tell y'all all the time. Well, you know, y'all got an emotional investment, so you read and you hear and you feel all these things about the Cowboys that I don't feel because I don't have an emotional investment in the Cowboys. They win, they win, they lose, they lose. It doesn't, it has no emotional bearing on me. I have an emotional bearing with my football team, my Ohio State football team. Uh, it's the only team I root for. Yeah, I root for the basketball team. But I don't get emotionally wrapped up into what the basketball team is doing because we ain't no basketball school. I'm like everybody else. If we got a great team, I hop on, <laughs> I hop on a bandwagon, sure, <laughs> and I ride them to the Final Four, which we've done a few times. But I don't get that caught up in the basketball team. Like I can't even tell you who's starting this year. I can't even tell you the names of the guys. I just know that they're pretty good and they beat somebody the other day that was a good win. But the football team now, that's what I follow. That's what I love. That's what my me and my dude bond over. That's what we talk about. Uh, you think I got a lot of Ohio State gear, bro? Yeah. My dude has probably more than me because for his birthday or for Christmas, I always buy him every year probably one hoodie and a couple of T-shirts. And if you can just multiply that over the last two or three years when he's kind of been the same size and hadn't grown all mm -hmm. that much except getting a little taller and stuff. He's got a bunch of stuff. Matter of fact, I just bought him a hoodie, a short sleeve hoodie, because he was admiring mine. And so I just bought him one yesterday. That's a surprise. <laughs> so hopefully he won't be nice. listening to the pie. But, dude, here this started at 4-something this morning. Yeah. As I was headed to the gym or leaving the gym or something, and somebody's like, hey, I think uh, we're going to flip the quarterback back to Texas. And he's talking about Quinn Ewers right. from South Lake Carroll. Mm-hmm. Not being very respectful, because I think he's a great high school player. And he should, I mean, he's the number one quarterback in the nation. And he should be a terrific player at my program or Texas program, or whatever program ends up with him. Now, check this out, Matt. This is, this is all honesty. I didn't care when he signed with Texas. Like, great, he signed with Texas. I was, I was pleased when he flipped to Ohio State. I mean, who wouldn't be pleased to get the number one quarterback in the country going to their program? But I'm, I'm, I am arrogant about my program because we've been good for a decade now. But, dude, we got a five-star coming in this year. We had a five-star last year coming in. And we have a four-star on the roster right now. That's two fives and a four. Quinn makes three fives and a four. So, the, you know, at Ohio State, at Alabama, at Clemson, I feel confident saying one recruit doesn't matter all that much. Just one. Now, if there's a string of them that you miss out on, okay, fine. That's different. But you tell me one recruit at Alabama that matters. If you get this guy, you don't get this guy. Oh, my God, what are we going to do? Right. Tell me, who, who is that guy at Alabama? Well, yeah, I mean, those are the three programs where that just doesn't apply because, and we've seen it year in and year out where, oh, this guy, Jalen Waddle's a great example of this. Oh, my God, Alabama lost Jalen Waddle. It didn't matter at all because the no. next five-star guy steps in and he either yeah. has it or he doesn't. And if he doesn't, okay, cool. Well, you obviously, we, it didn't work out. Our next five-star comes in. You know, so that started it. 
you know, and then all these guys, you guys will never beat Alabama. Like, I thought that was about? hilarious. Like, what, what are you talking about? Dude? They beat Alabama in the, it was technically early in 2015. It was the 2014 season in the playoff what? semifinal. I was in New Orleans for that game. Ohio State and Zeke ran all over Alabama and beat them 42 to 35 and won a national championship. That was just four or five years ago. And can I say something about the game yesterday? Alabama kicked our ass the other day. But, and I told this to Matt, and we talked about it on the podcast. I have seen us play before where we're outmanned and they're timid. That's how it was with Clemson a few years ago when they beat us like 35 to 7 or something like yeah. that. Uh, we weren't intimidated by Alabama. Alabama was just better, and a few of our guys were hurt. Now, I think Alabama was going to win anyway. But if our guys are – if we get our full roster – Based on who we had in the you know in the Clemson game, mm-hmm. then I mean the score was thirty eight twenty four with six minutes left in the third quarter. I'll take that because Alabama was better, but it's not like we didn't show up to play. Uh, it's not like we got run ruled, even though the final score was a blowout. Um, trust me, I've seen us get smoked and look non competitive in a championship caliber situation. I was in the stadium when Florida beat us, whatever it was, forty one fourteen or something yeah. like that. That was a non-competitive game, you know, and I see us fall apart against the LSU when Benny Wells got hurt. So I've seen that. This wasn't that. I'm a, I'm gonna tell you what Matt would tell you, as I speak for Matt here. Alabama, Clemson, Ohio State recruit at a different level right now than everybody else. And so what I'm saying is, as long as they continue to recruit at that elite level with Alabama and Clemson. They can absolutely hang with Alabama and Clemson. Now, whether they beat them every year, that remains to be seen. But from a talent standpoint, they can compete with them. And that's why I chuckle at, at, at A&M. Y'all, ain't, y'all haven't recruited the Aggies at that kind of level long enough to think that you can just roll in there and do it, you know, the first time through in Texas. As I told you, I mean, like, I don't know why they were coming for me, man. I'm like, why don't y'all beat Oklahoma first before you start taking on my program? Yeah, I, I think it's it, it's really interesting because to your point about Ohio State with Alabama and Clemson, it, it, it's just got to be from some of these people just an Ohio State hate because keep in mind, Ohio State was a Justin Fields interception at the end of the game the year before this past season of beating Clemson and having a chance and a shot at LSU, and I think it would have been a better game between LSU and Ohio. I don't know if Ohio State would have beat LSU last year, but I think it would have been a better game than Ohio State, or excuse me, LSU wiping the field with Clemson. They're right there with these teams. It, and, and so I also think it's interesting, but this is the way that it goes. And, and everybody that listens knows I'm a Texas fan. And there was a lot of Texas fans that were taking shots for whatever reason. You know, oh, Sarkeesian's coming in. Sark's going to turn this thing around. Quinn's going to recommit to Texas because of Sark. And I think it's fair to say, okay, I don't know that anybody was just elated that Steve Sarkeesian is coming in here as the coach. I think he is an offensive upgrade over Tom Herman. He has proven in his career as an offensive play caller that he can get the ball in the hands of guys that can make plays. He recruited hit and miss at Washington when he was there. He had a couple of top 20 classes. His second class at USC when he was there after the 2014 season, he had the number two class in the country. So that's really the only example that anybody has of this is a dude at a major program that jumped them. I think they were, what were they, 18th in recruiting the first year that he got hired in 2014 and then jumped them to second in recruiting, or I guess from 10th to second, sorry. But again, that's USC. And so you wonder, is it going to be that easy for him at Texas where guys want to come and play in that offense? And then the point is still, nobody knows. You have to believe in second chances. You have to believe that he has turned himself around. He's 46 years old now. When he first started as a head coach in collegiate football, he was, I believe he was 35. Right. So obviously there's some growth there and some of the problems that he's gone to that he openly talks about and the help that he has received. But to look at Steve Sarkeesian as a head coach and believe that all of a sudden he walks into Texas and works his magic, there's just nothing there. The hope is that as a Texas fan, yeah, they got this one right. 
that working under Saban and he has fixed himself and there's some things. He's obviously a great play caller. We saw great play calls with gobs of talent in the Alabama-Ohio State game the other night. But I, th- I thought it was interesting on Twitter this morning, the people that, that were just left and right. And then, of course, when you point out, wait a second, Ohio State beat Alabama. Well, no, no, in a football sense, that was a long time ago. Yeah, like, what is, what is that all about? Dude, that was five years ago. Um, you know, man, I, <laughs> I, I say this, and I say it all the time. Normally, it's when, I, when I'm talking to people uh, who are Michigan fans, and I tell them, Ohio State ain't worried about Michigan, man. We worry about ourselves. We're a big boy program. We worry about who's coming to our place and are we getting better. And I'm going to say it like this. I don't think Alabama is sitting around worried what everybody else is doing. I think Alabama worries about Alabama. I think Clemson worries about Clemson. I think when you're a real program and you focused on winning national championships, not not conference titles or, or right. getting to the conference championship game, you view the world differently. I mean, frankly, dude, that's why the Texas Longhorns make fun of the Aggies all the time because the Aggies are obsessed with what Texas does. And see, you, yeah. that's why I told a couple people this morning, you acting like Aggie fans, man. You sitting over here worried about it. We ain't thought about y'all, man. I mean, really, we haven't. And I haven't thought about Alabama or I haven't thought about Clemson. I thought about, you know, my program. I th- you want me to tell you my main thought about Ohio State the last two days, bro? Hmm. My main thought. Is Urban Meyer going to hijack our strength and conditioning coach? <laughs> <laughs> he might. Because he's one of the best in the country. Yeah. And uh, everybody, all the athletes who come through there swear by him. That's really been my main concern. There ain't been nothing about no other program. I worry only about my program. Yeah, and I think it's it's just one of those things, as long as Dabo's at Clemson, Saban's at Bama, and apparently Ryan Day is going to continue right along without any hitches with what Urban had there. As long as Ryan Day is at Ohio State, they're going to recruit on that level. They're going to compete on that level. And we'll see where it goes from here. I, I, I just find it. It's interesting. This is why something I, else, man. It's and I, I don't think p- enough people pay attention to this. And you as an Alabama fan would will realize this. will know this if and I, and I believe this is a big deal. And I think it's changed Ohio State's program. If if Alabama, Clemson or, and Ohio State are all competing for the best of the best players in the country. Where do all those guys go, man? They all go to the Nike camp, to the Under Armour All-American camp, to this All-Star game, to that All-Star game, okay? So, here's my point. When I'm an All-American, I'm a parade All-American, I'm an Under Armour All-American, I've seen Matt McLaren at the same five superstar bowl games and All-Star camps all over the country for the last two summers because we went as juniors and we went as seniors because we're five-star players. Because I've seen him up close and personal, because I know him, I've competed against him in these camps. Do you think I'm intimidated to play him? No, because I know him. There's no mystery to Matt McLaren because I've seen him play. We probably text each other like, yo, Doc, we're going to get you this week because we got you. Bring it on, man. We'll be ready. We ain't running. It's, it's like that. And so I think the intimidation factor, once you reach the elite level, leaves. It stays at some of the smaller places. Oh, did I just call Texas a smaller place? <laughs> I didn't mean to. Yeah, I did. So I just think it rolls like that. So I think, you know, I mean, y'all realize, like, I like Texas, right? I don't dislike Texas. I dislike A&M, but I like Texas. And uh, I wish Texas would have success. It'd be fun to watch them be good again because they ain't been good in a long time. I mean, yeah, no, it'd be nice if somebody could rise up and keep Oklahoma from winning the conference year in and year out just without – I mean, Texas hasn't done it in a decade, so well, you know, we'll, we'll see. Is that team that hangs around the national perimeter every year? Right. I mean, they've got the athletes; they can compete, but then they get in these games and they're not quite on the SEC level. We shall see. The other thing I, I had this was I almost respond, and I never jump in on Twitter arguments like this because it's pointless. When somebody sit here and, and tells you, "Wow, Ohio State will never beat Alabama in this day and age in college football," and it's like, I mean, actually, they did. Well, I, I, I mean, it, like now. Okay, I just I have a real hard time engaging with those people because especially when the guy goes, whatever he said was something like Ohio State will never beat Alabama as long as Saban is there. Facts. And Saban was the coach when Alabama lost. 
And then the guy responded and said, well, that was before they started with the spread and that game taught Saban that he needed the spread. And I almost well, responded to that because he's wrong. That's not the game. Lane <laughs> Kiffin was already the offensive coordinator that entire season. Lane Kiffin was brought in to put in a new offense because of what happened in the kick six game, not the missed field goal. It was the Iron Bowl. There have been books written about this in which you can read. And Saban had said that he got pissed off about the RPO with Nick Marshall that year because there were linemen down the field. And he said, if that's how they're going to do it and they're not going to call that as a penalty, we've got to start doing that. That's why Nick Saban went with the spread offense. It had nothing to do with the Ohio State game. Kiffin was already there. This is uh, you're referring to a a tweet from uh, G. Abraham 12 on Twitter. Yeah, there you go. That guy. This game happened a long time ago, in parentheses, in a football sense. How about this? With an overused running back who should have been a short yardage back. No deleting here. And so I hit him with the, y'all know what I mean. I hit him with the lowercase k, which means what you yeah, just, I know. <laughs> which means what you just said is completely, totally, utterly irrelevant and doesn't deserve a real response from me, because now what you're doing is you're not really trying to have a football conversation or a football debate. You're just taking shots at my team to see if you can get me all riled up. Right, right. Because anybody who saw Zeke Elliott in college would not say he was an overused running back who should have been a short yardage back. Yeah, see, I, I had no idea what he was referencing there. So, and, and then again, the, it, it, uh, I, one thing I love, love, love about college football is the passion. But then you get into these arguments where, like, especially when somebody says something that is factually incorrect and then puts in capital letters <laughs> facts, I'm just like, okay, I can't engage with you because you can't have a rational conversation about this. Right. I mean, you know, I it's guess wild, that. man. I mean, that's the beauty and the silliness of uh, college football. It is. It is. Uh, and, and that's also why when we talked about it yesterday, I said, you don't really see me indulging on my team on Twitter because I don't like to I don't like to, have to deal with all of that. Yeah, it's it's one of those wild things. And I know this was a strange, random conversation that had a lot of things going for it, but I wanted to to throw this out there before we move on from college football and you brought it up with A&M and we talked about it the other day. And I know a lot of Aggies listen and some of you are a little delusional. Some of you are actually realistic. And I, I can, I actually enjoy having conversations with my rivals when their fans are okay. Here's what I know. This is real. And and I'm right there with you, but I believe we can do this. Cool. I'm going to tell you this right now. Now, Kellen Mond is gone and we'll see how they replace him. But the SEC West may never be more ripe for A&M to win it than it will be next year. Bama's having to replace all those guys in offense. They probably will be able to, but there's no guarantee that Bryce Young, as a true sophomore, is all of a sudden going to take off next year at quarterback. Auburn, obviously, with Brian Harson, is going to be coming in with this new offense. Is that How long will that take to work? LSU is going to be much better than they were this year, but still not at the Joe Burrow level. And A&M, as I mentioned the other day, their non-conference schedule is pure shit, and their cross-SEC games scheduled for next year are South Carolina and Missouri. They should win both of those games. You've got to beat LSU, Auburn, and, and Alabama. Those are the games to circle at worst next year. I would pencil in A&M at 10 and 2. And if you can show that you can beat Bama somehow, A&M's got a shot next year and it may be their best year in a long ass time to actually win the division and show that they can belong. Well, I'm I'm going to say this, man, if they if they're good enough to win the division, then that means that they're good enough to to win a national championship. Uh, but they also going to have to do it with a quarterback who's never done it at this right. level. And that's the thing. And that's why if you're an Aggie fan, you may go, damn it. We get Missouri and South Carolina are literally there's there's six wins on their schedule from their non-conference in Missouri and South Carolina that are just right there. And then depending on you're, you're going to beat Ole Miss, you're going to beat Mississippi State. That's eight wins. And then it becomes, OK, Arkansas is going to be better. You should beat them. That's nine wins. It literally is going to come down to Auburn, LSU and Alabama. They'll be nine and three at worst next year. I'm telling you, assuming that they beat the teams that they're actually better than. We shall see. But if you are an Aggie, you better hope that quarterback coming in can work it, man, because you got a shot. 
As we continue here, it is time once again to check in. Brought to you by Soda, of course, from the Fort Worth Star Telegram. Longtime Cowboys beat writer Clarence E. Hill Jr. joining us here on the Jam Session podcast. And chill, Dan Quinn coming in, taking over this defense. What were your thoughts when you saw that Dan Quinn would be the new DC? I think that if you look at the proven uh, options out there, uh, he was the best proven option. This is not an out-of-the-box hire. This is not, you know, somebody you're going out and say, okay, this is a guy who will do some things differently. This is a guy you, you know what you're getting. Uh, former head coach, you could never go wrong there. A guy who ran, if you like, some people did what Chris Richard did. Well, he ran the Seattle defense better than Chris Richard. You know, he, he was the one who was there when they, you know, went to the two Super Bowls in back-to-back years and led the league in yards and points. And, and, and from what you're trying to do and, and, the, and the team that you have, there's nothing not to like about the move to bring Dan Quinn in. Who do you think he helps most? I think he helps the Mike Nolan ain't helped nobody. <laughs> I'm not thinking he helps the defensive line. I mean, you know, you 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 know, they Demarcus Lawrence, those guys get back to doing what they do best. A four three guy, though you know, obviously he does some different things and but he but he he helps the defensive line. He he allows them to do what they do best and and and, and he will scheme things up to get the guys in the right positions to uh uh to perform, I mean, he was a guy that, you know, obviously when Michael Bennett was there, he was a defensive end who they used the defensive tackle on passing downs and, and, and different things to get the best out of him. He played the position differently than, than they had previously been using it. But uh, I, I certainly think he helps the defensive line. But, but again, I think in this defense, it, it doesn't matter that, that you bring in Dan Quinn. You still need to upgrade the talent. I mean, and, and, and for this for this 4-3 to work, I mean – you need safety, and you need high-level safety play, and you need high-level defensive line play. The defensive line play, the defensive tackle play, when I say defense, I'm talking about specifically defensive tackle because the Cowboys have not had a special play at defensive tackle in a long, long time. And that allows uh-huh. the linebackers to run and make plays. And certainly we know the 4-3, and you know, you, you talk about the Legion of Boom in, in Seattle and, and they had two of the best safeties in the game to help make that thing go, and the Cowboys have not invested in that position. Cowboys have not had a big-time defensive tackle since Blunt smoking David Irving, and he was right. only there for and, a minute. And and he was not consistent. He was just coming into his own. He really had never put a full season together. You look at from the suspensions and everything else. But, yeah, he was, you know, it wasn't like you got a game in a game out. You saw the flash. You saw him have a couple good games. Uh, but we, we – he never really got to put it together. Right. That's what I'm saying. We just saw enough flash to know there's something there if he can never get it done. Well, that becomes a thing. Uh, yeah, they need to upgrade the talent, but how long do you think that takes? I mean, is that something that can be done in just a single off season? You got draft, you got free agency, but how much can they actually upgrade from what we saw last year, do you think? You certainly have the draft, and they got the draft capital. I mean, certainly you can you can you can get some players certainly at, at safety at quarterback at on the defensive line to help upgrade the cloud talent. Uh, you feel good about Gallimore. You hopefully maybe with him and Tristan Hill, and they like some things that Tristan Hill was doing before he got hurt, uh, and they certainly like the growth of Gallimore. But you go back to any name me a four three defense. Go back to the beginning of time that don't have a bad. I mean. You know, badass play from the defensive tackle. I mean, when you, you talk about special defensive, special defenses, special four three defenses, you know, you go back to the Tampa and the Tampa two, and you know, and and what they had with Warren Sapp. You go back to you know the heyday of the Cowboys. You need somebody in the middle of that defense wreaking havoc. Yeah. Hey, you know, one thing we haven't talked about, and we're talking about Dan Quinn, but I'm I'm curious because Dan Quinn's success is going to be built on that offense. Uh, what's the latest you heard on Dak and how his health is coming? I guess no news is good news, right? You know, you 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 you. If there was something that was bad about it, any setback, uh, we would have heard it, you know. But but just you know, from all the things that we've heard from the Cowboys brass on the record, off the record, that you know he's on schedule or ahead of schedule. There are no setbacks. Uh, certainly, saw him, you know. You know, when uh, Florida was at the Cotton Bowl walking to, to talk to uh, his former coach, uh, but there's nothing that, that heard, un, you know, whispered that that things aren't going well. He's not going to be ready to go. Well, if he is ready to go, is it a tag or are they going to have a long-term deal, do you think? Which one gets done before 
whenever the deadline well, I, mean, I think you have I think you have to tag him first because I mean first of all we got to see what the salary cap is going to be and you know yes yeah. today will be a good day to sign Dak Prescott let's put that out there. today <laughs> will be a good day yeah, to sign Dak Prescott okay and they could begin negotiations or could have begun negotiations you know as soon as the league year ended as soon as their season ended but you really can't get a grasp on what you're going to do or how you're going to do it, the kind of deal you want to get done until you know what the cap is going to be. And I know there was talk about it being 175 million, but there's a chance that it could be higher than that. But there's really no hard number on what the cap is going to be until the league decides what the cap actually is. How can they truly negotiate with Dak on a deal for next year? No, well, I guess you, I guess that's, that's the best point. So um, as, as we move toward the draft now, you all about the defensive lineman because this does not look like like a defensive heavy draft early on. Well, I mean, defensive lineman, defensive back. I mean, you know, Patrick Sertain Jr. will be a, it will could be there at ten. <laughs> you know, uh, one of the two cornerbacks would be there because everybody everybody's after quarterbacks, right? You know, so you 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 know, I have no problem with 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 with, with, a, with a cornerback at ten. You know, there's some people talking about an uh, offensive tackle. You know, you need to really find out what the future is uh, for Tyron Smith. Defense line, defense attack. I mean, uh, defense line, defense back. I, I, I think that I'm, I'm comfortable with that at ten. My intriguing thing is though, if the tight end from Florida is there, hmm. <laughs> Kyle Pitts is who you're talking about. I'm talking about Kyle Pitts. Yeah. Kyle Pitts he's a bad man now. He looks to be a bad man, and, and could be a special bad man. And listen. I like Patrick Sertain. I like his talent. I don't know if he's going to be Dion. I think he's going to be a quality corner in this league. I don't know. I don't, I don't see, you know, I, I, didn't, I didn't see Charles Woodson, you know, at Alabama this year, you know. But Kyle Pitts looks like he can be otherworldly at tight end. I'm just saying. You just you, – you're not sold on golf <laughs> I, know, I know, I know. They, they just took CD left. I know this. I'm just saying – that, I mean, I'm, you signed I mean, Jarwin to an extension before last season. I mean, it, it's well, listen, Dal- we love Dal- Dalton Schultz Jarwin showed you something be, now. We love Schultz. You love what Schultz has done. <laughs> Are they difference makers? No, no, of course not. Okay. Kyle, God, that would just be. I mean, can Kyle Pitts? If you draft him at ten, can a guy like that with as many offensive mm-hmm. weapons as they have come in and actually be a difference maker? Yes, red zone. Yes. Who's their red zone threat right now? No one, obviously, since they sucked ass in the red zone. <laughs> okay, I mean, yes, yes, yes. Now, again, you 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 want to be complimentary football, and and obviously, you know, you you invested so much, can you you can you can't necessarily justify a top ten pick on Kyle Pitts when you need so much help on defense? But man. Well, you know, it's that classic case of if he fall to you, then, you know. I think they would well, have I mean, a hard time doing it. Huh? I think they would have a hard time doing it. I don't know you would have – because you need so much help on there and you need difference makers on defense. And my thing is – But you don't want to reach for nobody. Like if no, you, you don't want to reach for nobody. And both corners were gone for whatever reason. Okay, there ain't no defensive guy there that we need that's worth taking with the 10th pick. I'm not trying to move down to 18 and get just some, you know, decent dude. What well, if well, you move down to 18 and get two decent dudes? I don't want two, two decent dudes. dudes. But, you know, me, I like I like difference makers. I like ballers. Right. I don't like just guys. And in every draft, and, and, there's only so many difference makers. And if you can get one, you know, they hard to pass on. Yeah, and, and to, to me, that's, what, that's the only thing that intrigues me about, 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 about Pitts is that he seems to be – Special. He seems to be you know, otherworldly. You know, guy who can be, you know, have a Hall of Fame talent to, to, to put up insane numbers for the next five years. But you know, they need defense. Let's let's get that out of our head. Defense, defense, <laughs> defense, defense, defense. You're the one that brings it up, but let's get it out of our heads. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, man, the only way, and it, I felt this way like with the C.D. Lamb pick, and I've always felt this way in the draft, the only way you take a Kyle Pitts is if he is right there, maybe after Trevor Lawrence or whoever else, if he's like two or three in that real top-level tier of your of your board, and then you have the cornerbacks for whatever level are not in that tier, and there's such a gap that 
you have to take them because I've always thought you got to go with your board. Otherwise, what's the point of putting one together? Yeah. And, and the difference between the city lamb thing is that he, you had him in your top five. Right, you right, know? right. And, and he came with there at 17. And so it, it was just so brand. And then let's look at the guys, the defense guys that they could have taken. What have they done this year? I mean, clearly it was the right move. You know, they were they were going to take the, the uh, defensive end from Alan from, uh, uh, Chase. Huh? Yeah, yeah. I mean, did he pee a drop? He didn't do much. I think he had one sack on the year and started only a couple of games. He didn't do a lot. Yeah, I mean, so, you know, clearly that, that was the right decision uh, to go in that direction. Now, uh, this year, it's a difference between picking 17 and picking 10. And 10, right, right. you know, you, you should have a chance to get a difference maker no matter the position. Now, one and of they the need like, defense. Mm-hmm. Now, one of the things we like about Chill is he has lots of opinions about lots of things. <laughs> <laughs> so... And once we get through the Cowboys chat, we also we often like to ask him two or three questions just to get to gauge his temperature on things. Uh, so let's start with Urban Meyer. It feels like he's on his way to Jacksonville. Is he going to make Jacksonville a playoff team in four years? Oh, I, I think he has a chance to, to make him a playoff team. I think he has a chance to be the most successful college coach going to the NFL since Jimmy Johnson. Why is that? You look at the situation, you look at the cap room, you look at the mm-hmm. draft pick, uh, you look what he's done in college. He's won at every stop, like Jimmy. It wasn't just one stop. He's won at every stop he's gone and won at a high level. The guy knows talent, uh, and, and, he, and he knows players. I, I think certainly he has a chance to win. I'm just mad that he'd rather live in Jacksonville than Austin. I, I'm, I'm still <laughs> kind of I, – I, I don't get that. Right. You know, uh, the, Jacksonville of Austin. Who picks Jacksonville of Austin? Maybe he wants to play at the TPC. I mean, there is the beach there. <laughs> okay, it's in Jacksonville. It's not Miami Beach. I mean, it's not Miami, but it's still – It's just, it's just they have some solid beaches in Jacksonville. Yeah, but it's, yeah, you it's don't old have to ladies on them, not young ladies. You don't have to deal with the boots. That's true. It's, yeah, it'll be interesting to see the success that he has well, there. I think my biggest question, and I've seen some of this, is, is he's trying to put a real – experienced NFL staff around him is he has never run an, run an NFL offense or anything remotely close to an NFL offense, which is why no quarterback he's ever had. They've been great college quarterbacks. They haven't done anything at the NFL level. And I just wonder if he can adapt to that as a coach. Well, I think the one thing that we know about him is that he is a true um, coach's coach, you know, and he is a CEO coach, although most of him he did – was known for his offense, and his you know his offense has succeeded you know in, in different stops. But he's a coach's coach. I mean, you know, he had you know he allowed his coaches under him, whether it was Ryan Day or Tom Herman, to 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 run his offense and run the offense, and he coached the coaches, and clearly he coaches his coaches to the highest level. And so I, I think that we have to get him give him the benefit of the doubt that he will adapt because he will coach the coaches. He will hire the right coach and allow them to do their job and lead them the right way. And the only other question I got about him is he's such a bad loser. He's worse than Mike Zimmer. Uh, You know, (laughs) Zimmer going to a funk for three days when he lost. I'm no good. We suck. I'm terrible. And then he pops out of it. Like, Urban lost nine games in nine years. He finna lose nine next year. Uh, You know, whether he can handle it mentally to me would be a a legitimate concern. Yeah, but but – yeah, and, and and you know you look at Nick Saban to all, all those all the you know Bill Parcells you know they 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 hate losing more than they the joy of winning you know and and so right. you know that that that's I think a problem with every great coach but certainly you look at the college coach you really haven't had to lose that much yeah it's going to be an adjustment but I would think he's a mature man and he he understands the NFL is different than college like all his college players have to take losing after never losing. Uh, before going to different situations, uh, you know, so uh, it's an adjustment. But again, if I'm going to bet on anybody, it's going to be Urban because of his history. He's won everywhere. There's no reason why he's not going to win here. What do you think, James Harden will win in Brooklyn? <laughs> you know that that is the it, it didn't work with Westbrook. Now we expect it to work with Harden and Irving and. Durant, and there's one thing for him and Durant to get along. It's just Kyrie Irving is part of the mix that <laughs> that that is the issue, and 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 it's just crazy 
that you look on the pa- on paper, this big three may be the most talented big three we've ever seen. We've ever seen put together. You look at going back to Miami and to all the other big, this may be the most talented big three ever assembled, but can they share the ball? Can they get along? Because they all need the ball to score and do their things. KD is the only one who's really had to adapt his game. He's done it well. He did that in, 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 uh, with the Golden State. He was able to adapt his game to other players. But these two guys, really, Kyrie and, 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 and Serna James, have never really had to adapt them, their game and really uh, subjugate their game to, to, to someone else. And, and will they do that? Are they willing to do that? And, and can Kyrie, uh, can, can Harden get in shape? <laughs> Will he get in he just, shape now? I, yeah, yeah we'll I think he was. I think that was part of his. I'm mad at y'all. I'm not gonna get in shape. I'm gonna be a fat guy. Oh my god, he. Oh, well, it worked. A, round mount <laughs> rebound. Goodness, John Bagley looking rascal. I mean, can you get in shape? Or can Kyrie show up? I mean, the thing about it is, is the first two games of the season we were so excited about Brooklyn they looked like world beaters, and what they're they're six and six now. Uh, you know. Like it, 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 it is it is crazy, and Kyrie hasn't played in a week. And you know, is, is he going to show up? Is he going to be suspended for violating obvious COVID protocols? It, 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 it's, just, it's just a lot there, you know. So we, we we've learned a long time ago. You just can't put talented players uh, together and think that they're going to achieve and, and become a team. Mm-hmm. You know, LeBron, and that's one of the, 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 the beauties of LeBron game because he's able to meld his game with other players. You know, and, and he's been able to do that, you know, and, and, and win titles. Can these other guys, can these guys do that? All right. Clarence E. Hill, Jr., we appreciate it, man. Thanks for jumping on with us. No problem, guys. Have a good day. Right, see you. There he is, Fort Worth Star Telegram's own. <laughs> Always a fun conversation with Chill, that's for sure. You know, I wanted to jump in on what we were just talking about with Chill. But before we get to that, let's tell you, of course, about the wonderful people at Freeway Tire Shop. It was funny because I think it was DFW car guy. I don't know if you saw on Instagram. He was over there. He was like, hey, guys, I had some wings last night and this morning I'm getting tires at Freeway Tire Shop. (laughs) And he was singing their accolades, said, JR, such a good dude. He's my guy now. And I'm telling you, man, JR and the guys at Freeway Tire Shop will get you taken care of. It's right there off of 35, just north of downtown Dallas. Competitive pricing, elite customer service. It's one of those places that can handle it all for you man inspections y'all got to get one at some point oil change same thing alignments tires he will take care of the jam session audience and the other thing he can do is he can take care of uh you know cars like i've got like a honda which is kind of like your normal everyday american car he can take care of high-end cars like a uh, mercedes or the lovely lorraine's got a jack she took it by there the other day and they did a lot of work on it uh she's raving about it uh, she's been driving it the last couple of days so They can fix anything, man, and that's what I like. It's not one particular brand, one Mm -hmm. particular car. Whatever you got, they can fix it. So make that happen. Freeway Tire Shop, you can check them out online, request a quote, and, of course, you can also schedule an appointment at freewaytireshop.com. And as I just mentioned, those wings at Kroger, man, and I have been told there is a possibility, hopefully we'll find out soon, that more flavors may be on the way. But right really? now, yeah, yeah, we, we will find out more information for sure coming up. But mango habanero and buffalo blue cheese are the two flavors. Most North Texas Kroger locations carry these right now. You walk into Kroger, you go into the back where you get your meats cut. They're fresh. They're not frozen. It's meat and it's flavor. And you just tell the dude in the back, say, hey, man, wrap me up a couple of pounds, whichever flavor you prefer. And you know what? I'm going to have to do that this weekend because I haven't had them in like a month. And we need to go to the store. So I'll be getting wings from Kroger probably either today or tomorrow. (laughs) Well, good. And then when you get them, maybe you'll put them on a grill. Maybe you'll put them in the air fryer like I do. Maybe you'll put them in a broiler like I've done. Or I keep waiting for somebody to throw them on top of the skillet in a cast iron skillet and uh, see how they turn out there. Yeah, it's interesting because we've seen a variety of different ways because a lot of you guys have sent us pictures of them and whatnot, which is awesome. Which I think is funny. I know, and it makes me really (laughs) curious to try some of those different ways of... Because it, in my, for whatever reason, and I guess it's because my dad does them on the grill. And so just to me, I'm always like, oh, you just grill them. But putting them in like you were talking about where you broil them or maybe even trying oh, them yeah. in an Instapot or something like that. I'm curious to see what they would be like. Uh, broiler was, was really good, man. I, I bet. Mean, it took about 30 minutes, but uh, they were fine. Terrific. 
Yeah, so check that out. The wings from Kroger, mango habanero, or buffalo blue cheese. But I wanted to get into, and we were just talking about this with Chill, as we take a look about some of the things happening around the NFL. It does look like Albert Breer, your Ohio State Buckeye brother, had a tweet earlier that this is going to happen, essentially, that the Jaguars are finalizing a deal and that Urban Meyer is going to take over as the next head coach for the Jacksonville Jaguars. And man, I I was like, chill. I, I Man, it would have been awesome if Texas could have gotten him. I think that he wanted to go to the NFL to see if he could do it at that level, obviously, as this is turning out. But I also think it had to be the exact right situation. And Jacksonville... For a guy like that, for a dude who can build a program, he did it at Bowling Green. He did it at Utah with Alex Smith. He obviously did it at Florida where he won a couple of national championships, and he did it at Ohio State where he won a national championship. This is a guy who wins and can build. It's going to be one of the most intriguing looks because they got the number one pick. They can take Trevor Lawrence, so now your quarterback is secure. That's the hardest thing to find. Well, and you hope you'll be able to develop him, and he's going to be that guy that uh, that you know most people who are paid to know these things think he will be. They've also got like a hundred million dollars worth of cap room, and they got like eleven draft picks. You know, mm-hmm. four or five or six in the top hundred this year, something like that. And so when you look at it like that, that makes it a great job because now. We can set the draft. We can get the quarterback. We can get, you know, if you're taking draft number one overall, your first three rounds, because I think they got two second round picks too. Basically, those first three or four guys you get should really be walk-in starters at key spots. But when you got $100 million in salary cap space, now you got room to go out there and get you some, some young in their prime guys in free agency to really accelerate your program. And so then once the talent's taken care of, man, it's up to Urban Meyer to establish a culture. And that's what he's king of. Culture changing, getting everybody to buy in, all his leadership stuff. That's what he excels at. And if he's got the players and they buy in, then he'll be able to get it done. But I'm telling you, man, we've all experienced this, whether it's playing Madden or college football or whatever. There's a difference when you don't have a talent advantage everywhere. There's just a difference, man. And you don't show up and say, okay, I can mark down nine wins. We just got to get ready for Michigan and Penn State. Yeah, it's obviously going to be a lot different, especially in year one. I think he is a guy that – and he had won, what was it, like in year two, I think, at Florida, year two at Ohio State. I I think you can give him a year, and I think he can be okay with that first year. The frustration will come if it doesn't happen fairly quickly, like in year two or three, I think, at Jacksonville. That's going to be a lot different than anything that he is used to happening in the college game. To your point, Jacksonville does have 11 picks in the 2021 draft. They have the first overall pick, so he will get to groom Trevor Lawrence and see if Trevor Lawrence really is the guy that everybody thinks he can be. They also have the Rams pick from the Jalen Ramsey trade. Now, the Rams are still playing, so obviously that's going to be in the late 20s, but they do have two first-round draft picks. They have two second-round draft picks. They will have the 33rd overall pick, and they own Minnesota's second-round pick. Minnesota wasn't very good this year, so that's the 45th pick in the draft. So walking in, Urban Meyer, $100 million in cap space, and four picks in the top 45 of the draft. And he is a guy, now I don't know how some of the NFL veterans will look at him. He is all over the place having Florida and Ohio State alums. I'm sure there's several that play in Jacksonville. But he is a dude that knows the college game very well. And I imagine those four first round, or excuse me, those four picks in the top 45, he's very aware of that level of talent in the college game to help bring those guys in. Yeah, and the... um what I and I think we've had this conversation before. The beauty to me and why he was able to replicate it is he did the same thing Bill Parcells did, which is he understands the type of players he wants to have that make his offense go or make his philosophy go. And he's been a genius at finding those guys. And so the question will be, can he find those guys uh, at the NFL level? Because, you know, in, in the college level, you just go recruit that guy. Mm-hmm. And there's six of them out there in America. And as long as we get one or two of them or one of them, we good. Well, it doesn't work like that in the NFL. And so, you know, how he can build the guys, get the guys that he wants to run his offense and run his defense, that'll be 
really interesting. And here's something not very many people have talked about because we get so caught up in offense, defense schemes and stuff. Um, you know, Urban Coates, I mean, he mandated it by himself, uh, for himself, but he coached special teams at Ohio State. That was his area. He let everybody else handle the offense, mm-hmm. defense. I coach special teams. And so I think he'll put a real emphasis on trying to win. I mean, everybody talks about special teams, but I think he'll put an emphasis on really trying to win special teams uh, to take a little bit of burden off his offense and defense. And I think not only do you have what is going to be a very young roster with the amount of draft picks that he has, the leeway and free agency, the AFC South is a very winnable division. I think he can get to the playoffs a lot quicker than people may anticipate. Who the hell knows what's going to happen in Houston? Whether Watson is there or not, they have to get somebody that can come in there and build around him. Phil, or excuse me, Indian, Indiana, Indiana, Indianapolis, the Colts. Jesus, what am I trying to say? Philip Rivers. <laughs> I combined Philip Rivers and Indianapolis, and it screwed me up. Philip Rivers obviously is not the future. Now, he got it done this year for the Colts. Is he done? Is he walking away? If so, what do the Colts do at quarterback? And then, of course, the Tennessee Titans with Tannehill and Henry, they've had success right now, but how much longer is that going to sustain? We shall see. Point being that I think the AFC South is one of those divisions where you could walk in. I don't know that it happens in year one, but you give Urban Meyer a couple of years to get his guys in there to reset the roster, a couple of years to groom Trevor Lawrence, and I can see Jacksonville being the division champ. I could see them winning the division in 2022, if not 2023 for sure. Normally, you you envision a build that goes one and fifteen, seven and nine, ten and six, you know, eleven five, twelve and four. Mm-hmm. But uh, that second year, yeah, it can be done, man, if you got the right pieces in there. And here's the deal. What's, uh, what does Urban Meyer walk in with? He walks in with cachet. Everybody right. knows Urban Meyer. It's the same thing we said. Like, nobody knew Mike Nolan. I'm right. betting you. They all know Urban Meyer. They either seen him on TV or they coached him. And they all calling the Ohio State boys right now. Like, yo, what's up with Herb? What's up with Herb? What's up with Herb? What's up with Herb? And, uh, you know, the vast majority of those guys would be like, oh, you'll love him. Yeah, I mean, think and about so, that. Because yeah. and it's not just Ohio State, it's Florida as well. And the amount of NFL talent that is in the league that played with him, that's familiar with him, yeah. it's, it's one of those things. That, there's guys yeah. on every roster that are familiar with Urban Meyer that probably played for him. And he's got that six degrees of separation from everybody. Yeah. So you don't have to go far to find somebody who's got a personal experience with him. You know, again, you know, my, uh, my cousin played for him in Florida. He talks about him all the time. So, I mean, my nephew played for him in Florida, so he talks about him all the time. And that's how close it is to find somebody who knows about Urban Meyer. Uh, But, uh, dude, oh, you know one thing we haven't talked about? What? The other beauty of Jacksonville. Ain't no media down there. That's true. Nobody's going to be worrying you to death every day. Yeah, it'll be more media now, but they're not going. I mean, it's not like New York or it's not like Philly. No, it's compl- It's not like Dallas. I mean, it's going to be completely, completely different for Urban Meyer than what he is used to. And uh, it's going to be very interesting because if it works, if Trevor Lawrence is that guy, they've got a couple of good receivers down there. I mean, their receiving core is not horrible with, with DJ Chark and Chenault is down there. They obviously need some pieces to come in, but I'm very intrigued to see what Urban Meyer is going to be able to do and if it'll be successful and if he can do not what Barry Switzer did, but what Jimmy Johnson did or what Pete Carroll did, which is have that level of success, build a program, an elite level program in college and then walk into the NFL and replicate that and have success. And really, Jimmy Johnson and Pete Carroll are what Urban Meyer is striving to try and replicate. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, as we move on in the NFL, we mentioned Houston in the AFC South, and I don't know what is going on in Houston, but that thing is becoming a shit show with Deshaun Watson is apparently pissed because he was told originally, it sounds like, that he would be consulted in the search for a GM and he was not. They hired a GM without asking him about the dude. And Deshaun Watson, from what you read, it's basically like it almost sounds like he's about the James Harden this thing where or Antonio Brown it and say, I don't want to be here. You guys pissed me off. You traded hop. Okay. I was a little pissed, but whatever. And now you told me things that I would be involved in and all this. And I wasn't, and you you need to move on from me. I want to be traded. I think that's a tricky thing. And I think that's where Houston screwed up is don't tell me if if I'm not involved then I'm not involved, but don't tell me I'm involved. Yeah. And then you change your mind and go, nah, 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 we're going to go the other route. 
Um, I think that creates an unnecessary rift and unnecessary problem. And uh, I think I read somewhere the other day where the owner, the team owner said that he, he had reached out to him but hadn't heard back. That's almost like the silent treatment. It'll be interesting to watch because he can blow it up in the sense of, I just won't show up for the offseason. Oh, none of that stuff is mandatory. Yeah. I'll see y'all, you know, at the start of training camp. Um, if you're a new coach, you know, you, you want to make sure he's on board with what you're trying to do. Uh, and this is why, you know, some people, like I saw Dick Vermeil on uh, TMZ Sports. Uh, he was like, ah, Deshaun needs to get some diapers. Players don't need to be involved in this or that. And at one level, that's cool. You don't have to be, man. But pretty much every organization clues the face of the franchise, the CEO in, on what they're doing. I mean, yeah. you think the Cowboys signed Deion Sanders without telling Troy? No. Hey, we're about to commit $35 million to Deion. What, what do you think? You think he'll fit in our culture? You think he'll be a good... You know, you think he can fit in with you and Mike and Emmett? I mean, do you want him here? Because I guarantee you, if Troy, Emmett, and Michael had said, nah, bro, we ain't, we ain't interested in Dion and all that here, then he wouldn't have been here. You take your best guys and you ask them their opinion. It uh, doesn't mean you do it, but you at least want to get their feel for it and what they think and say, hey, well, we're still thinking about it. It might happen, but we'll, we'll keep you posted. Um, that's what you do with your best player. I mean, let me ask you this, man. You think... Cuban and Carlisle are going to make a move to bring in somebody without talking to Luca? No, sir. Hey, hey, Luca, you, you want to play with this dude? We're thinking about getting this guy. You think his game matches with yours? What you, what you think? What's your opinion? How you feeling? I mean, that just happens, man. That's just that's part of doing business in today's world. Now, you didn't have to do that maybe 25, 30 years ago, but you got to do it now if you want to keep peace in your organization. And the fact that 84-year-old Dick Vermeil felt differently should surprise no one because he's 84 <laughs> years old. Right, yes. Times have changed. You know, he probably thinks long hair and dreads are bad because everybody should have their hair cut above their ear. Yeah, it, it's it's not 1973 anymore. It, it's definitely it's a not. different world. So who knows what will happen in Houston. I've seen the proposal that they could trade with Miami because – the idea is that Deshaun Watson would be willing to waive his no trade clause for that. It, it, maybe it makes sense. Miami's got some pieces. Maybe they're ready to go, and you bring in Tua. I, who knows? I, I don't know exactly how that would work for Houston. Elsewhere in the what the hell is going on, and you got to love this, man, Philadelphia. <laughs> Philadelphia, the Eagles, Doug Peterson, from what I was reading, apparently – I can't remember. This might have been Schefter. I can't remember who who had this. But apparently he was ready to move on to Jalen Hurts. And Jeffrey Lurie, the owner of the Eagles, was like, no. I mean, why wouldn't you be like, I just gave Carson Wentz like $140 million. He's our guy. And Figure you told me to give him $140 million. Right. And so now they couldn't see eye to eye on that. So they fired Doug Peterson. And they're trying to find a head coach. I was hoping and hoping and hoping when I saw this report that they'd be dumb enough to do this. <laughs> but there was a report that they were interested in Adam Gase because apparently Dude. he's some supposedly some quarterback whisperer. Stop, and I, stop, stop. I'm not. This is what I was reading. And I'm sitting here. I read that tweet. and I was like, oh, my God, please hire Adam Gase. <laughs> you will be you will be at the bottom of the division and completely irrelevant for the next three or four years until you got to fire him. You've wasted Carson Wentz. This could be a glorious time period for Cowboy fans. Dude, they've got problems in Philadelphia because they got turmoil. And now I can tell you exactly what's going to happen now, Matt. I can tell you exactly what's going to happen. It doesn't even matter who they hire. They now have what no NFL team wants. They have a full-fledged quarterback controversy where uh, it'll split the locker room. And that doesn't mean the locker room is split 50-50. Right. It could be split 70-30, 75-25. It doesn't matter if it's not, you know, 98 percent to 2 percent. It's a problem because why? Check this out, man. If your guy is not the starter, then what do you do? You talk to your friends in the media. You talk to your agent. Your agent tells his friends in the media. Well, you know, maybe we would have won. Maybe uh, Jalen wouldn't have thrown those interceptions. He hadn't been out there on Broad Street chilling at the club the other night. Yeah. Hey. Maybe did y'all know that Carson only leaves every day at four thirty? The rest of us here till seven. 
I mean, it just happens, man. It happens everywhere. There's a quarterback controversy. And here's my prediction. They're going to have to get rid of one of them cats. They can't both coexist because of the way that they organize it and the way right. they set it up and the way they did it. They're going to have to get rid of one of the two because the players in the locker room are the ones who who won't let it go. Because every time they lose a game or something happens, they'll be like, my guy wouldn't have done that. My guy's great. Yep. It, it, they've got a real problem, and it is wonderful to see – how far those mighty eagles have fallen. And I thought this was interesting because, and this is according to our good buddy Todd Archer. You just heard him on our last episode of the podcast. ESPN NFL Nation Cowboys reporter who reported this morning that the Philadelphia Eagles have requested an interview with Kellen Moore for their head coach opening. Interesting. Let me ask you this. You think that's a serious request or that's a fact-finding mission? I don't know. It, it's bec- I mean, look, Kellen Moore just turned down Boise State and signed a three-year contract extension with the Cowboys. He's 32 years old. I, I, I honestly am not exactly sure what this is with the Philadelphia <laughs> Eagles. Or maybe it's just, hey, we're, we have screwed this thing up so bad. We are swimming through a river of shit like Andy Dufresne at the end of Shawshank. <laughs> maybe we can mess with the Cowboys a bit and steal their offensive coordinator. Yeah, I don't know. I got, I got, I don't know how I feel about that. I don't either. Cause I don't, cause I don't know. I don't know if I believe it to be a real interview. Like they're going to hire him to be their next head coach, or they seriously want him to be the next head coach. Right. I don't know. I don't know. Who Maybe knows at this wild. point? But That'd look to me, though. if you're if you're seriously considering Adam Gase, then I I would completely believe you are seriously considering Kellen Moore. Well, you know what? You make a good point because I would take Kellen Moore over Adam, Adam Gase. Any day of the week. Yes, a hundred times out of 100, I would take Kellen Moore over Adam Gase. How in the world there is a franchise in the NFL that actually believes Adam Gase should be a head coach is beyond me. And you know what? I could see, um, I could see, uh, actually, the more I think about it, the more I could see, I could see Kellen Moore there. Why? Because you need a guy who can get with, with Wentz and, and work with Wentz. And what's he done with Dak? He's been, you know, Dak swears by him. Okay, I could see that. You need a guy who can get inside Wentz's head and get the best out of Wentz. And then if that's not the case, well, then, you know, Jalen Hurts is in the Dak mold, although Dak is far mm. better player. But he's in that Dak mold, and so then you could also use him to uh, to be that kind of quarterback coach and that kind of offensive coordinator. That being said, there's a hell of a lot more to being a head coach than just coaching the offense. It's all the right. ancillary stuff that uh, that drives coaches crazy. Definitely slightly different. We'll see. Who knows? That's just the report out there from Arch. We'll see if the Eagles do that and, and what becomes of it, if anything at all, or even if Kellen Moore would want to interview for it. We'll find out. But the NFL, of course, also, we would be remiss if we don't at least take a look at some of the things that we are seeing here with the divisional round matchups coming up here on Saturday and Sunday. It's again two games on Saturday, two games on Sunday. The first game of divisional round weekend, the Rams on the road at Green Bay and the Packers against Aaron Rodgers. After what we saw the Rams do to Seattle, I kind of raised my eyebrows a little bit because I didn't see that coming at all. I, I just don't think that they're on that level with Green Bay and the level that Aaron Rodgers had an all-time epic quarterbacking season, even for him this season. And I just think it seems like he's on a mission. I'd be shocked if they lose their first playoff game at Lambeau Field. No, I don't think they're going to lose it. I think Aaron Rodgers is too good. And I think the Rams are banged up. Uh, And I don't think the Rams can score a whole lot of points. And so I think Aaron Rodgers will figure out how to create some points. And again, this is just your boy now. And I don't say I'm breaking any news. But until a team from Cali shows up in Green Bay and wins, mm-hmm. I don't really believe a team from Cali is showing up to Green Bay and wins. <laughs> Pretty That's much. That's just me. I mean, I think that yeah. he's, and it's not even like it's going to be, you know, like classic Green Bay cold. But if you're from Cali, then 24 might feel like zero. Yeah, it's quite a bit different. <laughs> quite you a know, bit different, you know. I mean, it's going to, you know, when you're from Cali, man, you're going to be like this lady at church last, uh, when was that? went to church for the first time in a long time like three weeks ago and it was probably 45 degrees why was it a lady that had a mink coat and i told lovely lorraine like she ain't been able to wear that coat all year and she's just like 
I want to pull the mink out. Like, in 45 degrees? I mean, I guess. If that's your thing, you know, if whatever works. Thing. But, yeah, it'd be some football players pulling out their minks out going to Green Bay, man. And it'd be <laughs> balmy by Green Bay standards. Oh, there's no doubt about that. For sure that's happening. And then, of course, the late game on Saturday night, the Ravens on the road up in Buffalo against the Bills. The Bills trying to get to an AFC championship game for the first time. Probably some of you are listening be like, wow, that'll be the first time in my life. And you would be correct. They haven't been in, what was it, 1994, I believe, was the last time that they went. It's been a long-ass time. Might have been 93. But Buffalo at home, Josh Allen, Lamar Jackson, I said this before the season ended. I think Buffalo is that team, the only team that has a shot to legit take down the Chiefs this year. And and Lamar Jackson can play out of his mind. I just think Buffalo is a better overall team. Yeah, it's just um, I'm always when 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 these teams haven't done it yet, their first time through, it's just always hard to predict Mm. how they'll perform. I think it was good. Buffalo had to struggle a little bit last week against the Colts. But I like Buffalo, and here's the deal, man. Their quarterback is a playmaker. Yeah. Uh, That being said, they got to deal with the Baltimore swag. They got to believe. You know, I tell you this to you all the time, man. It's not about what you say. It's like whether you believe in your heart that you're the better team and that you should win the game. Uh, But I think uh, these are two of the young, very interesting quarterbacks. And again, man, I'm going to give Buffalo the edge because I think their passing game is better than than the Ravens' passing game. I agree. And and I do think Buffalo is going to win that game and and get to the AFC Championship game. Who will they play? We'll find out. Sunday's early game is the Browns on the road against the Chiefs. Baker Mayfield and Cleveland rolling into Arrowhead. And again, the fans aren't going to be in effect on this one. It's Pat Mahomes trying to get back to yet, what is this, a third consecutive AFC title game. The interesting thing here is that the Chiefs chose to rest their guys in Week 17. So it's been a while since their stars have played. It's been, again, they were off last week. They were off the week before. And you wonder... With Cleveland rolling through Pittsburgh, can Cleveland maybe be ready to go? And if, if if the Chiefs don't come out right away ready to roll, maybe that's Cleveland's chance. But I, I just – I can't see this, man. I, I, Kansas City is the best team in the NFL. I, I think they'll be fine. Kansas City is a team that's capable of falling down 14 to nothing, the light coming on, and then just wiping the field with the other team. <laughs> they could, man. They are terrific. Uh, I still think uh, I still think winning brings out their passion. Uh, their guys are still – they just got playmakers across the field, man. Um, you know, to the point of, okay, we done took Tyreek out and we figured out a way to take Travis Kelsey out. Well, that's when we ain't heard nothing from Sammy Watkins in a month and he'll show up and catch six for 142 and two touchdowns. Yeah. They do stuff like that, man. They're a terrific team. They're hard to stop. And uh, I think they enjoy playing the game. I think Andy Reid makes it fun. I think they always got some stuff in their playbook. They're like, man, can't wait till we throw this on them this week. And I think, I think he keeps it fun, and uh, that's one of the reasons why they win. And then wrapping it up on Sunday night, you knew this would be the Sunday evening game. Tampa Bay in the Dome against the Saints. Brady breeze for the third time this season see this is where it gets weird because I actually think that this is going to be a really good game I think Tampa Bay and Tom Brady can get this done some road team is winning and not all four home teams win this weekend (laughs) somebody's going to go on the road without fans and win a game Tom Brady it would not surprise me if somehow some way he's the guy that does it no, I mean, I don't think the Saints are a great team. I don't think the Bucks are a great team. So if they're both kind of the same, you know, if it comes down to the same old few things. I think it matters that there's not a home crowd because, what, the Dome is legit when there is. Yeah. Um, you know, but although that being said, you know, Tom Brady ain't going to be bothered by no crowd. Um, this is going to be a great game, man. Um I don't. I don't know. I think uh, it's hard to beat a good team three times. It is. There's that, and the fact that it's Brady. I. I don't know. I. I 
I want to say I feel like the Saints are going to win. They've got a really good defense. At some point, you keep wondering, is Breeze ever going to get back to another Super Bowl? And then he runs into Tom Brady, and, and maybe Tom Brady goes, sorry, man, you're still Phil Mickelson, <laughs> and I'm still Tiger Woods. Dude. So, yeah, I think the Bucks are going to somehow find a way to get this done in the rubber third match between these two. I guess it's not the rubber match because the Saints won the first two, but – Give me Bucks and Packers with a a Brady Rodgers NFC title game, and then the Chiefs and Bills with two I mean stud young quarterbacks with Mahomes and Allen in the AFC, and that sets up. I mean, it'll be Chiefs are going to the Super Bowl again. I believe that. Will Aaron Rodgers finally get back to another one, or is Tom Brady going to go to the NFC and be like, "Ha ha, I still did it to you and Breeze." <laughs> Dude, that would be unbelievable. It would be. I think- it would be. I think uh, they would have a hard time winning up in Green Bay in the championship game atmosphere. I would think so, but with Tom Brady, man, I, who knows? That dude I'm is say ice. never with Tom Brady now. I know, I know. Who knows? But th- that's a look at the divisional round weekend. A couple more sponsors that we would like to discuss with you. HFX Foundation Solutions has been telling you about these guys for a while now. Mentioned this the other day, but y- your home is like anything else. It gives you signs of when there is a problem if you know what to look for then you can pick up the phone and call hfx foundation solutions so that it's not as serious as it could be if you wait cracks in the foundation cracks in the ceiling sticking doors sloped floors all those types of things are telling you call them it is a free inspection they can come out and let you know if there really is a problem and if there is the good news is they will help you and be there with you the whole way through the process 817-770-0174 they're an a-rated business with the better business bureau and you can check them out online at hfxfoundation.com make that happen they will take care of you man i'm telling you right now they will get you taken care of And of course, False Idol Brewing, man, I am actually, it's either going to be tomorrow on Friday or Saturday afternoon, but we're going to make our way over there this weekend. They're releasing some new beers coming out tomorrow on Friday that I think sound absolutely fantastic that I am very much looking forward to checking out. Love their tap room, man. Dom and Brandon and those guys, we've had them on the podcast, been out there many times right there in North Richland Hills, a phenomenal place making great locally crafted beers. And Friday, many of you are listening to this on January 15th. They are releasing four new cans. Viva Los Vaqueros, a Mexican lager. Ghost Eye Cranberry Crumble Burliner Vice. The Still Drippin' New England Triple IPA. And the Double Down Cookies and Cream Imperial Stout. All four of those beers, brand new releases, dropping. Friday, January 15th at False Idol. I told the lady, man, I was like, you know what? Hopefully they also have all those on tap. I imagine they do because that's a flight right there. That's what I was really, you know, in the, in the new way I think these days. That was really the way I thought about it like that. Like, it sounds like a flight to me. Yes, and it'll be delicious because that's all they do. False Idol Brewing, North Richland Hills. Get by and see those boys. Now, we do have an episode of Just a Sip coming up that we are going to to fit in here on this episode. But before we close it out with Just a Sip, the NBA, we were talking to Clarence E. Hill Jr. earlier on the podcast, and we mentioned the James Harden trade. And it was funny because earlier you had put up a poll on Twitter of basically which do people care about more, Urban Meyer to the Jags or the James Harden trade, right? And I clicked on Urban Meyer to the Jags, and I told you, I was like, man, I just, for whatever reason, and this is really rough for me right now because I'm not going to switch services and pay more money and do all that shit that it takes to try and find the Mavs anymore. You're not going to be extorted. Correct. I think it's ridiculous. It, it's unbelievable to me that these franchises that are worth billions of dollars and a television parent company that's worth billions of dollars can't figure out how to make it work to where they can come to an agreement so that you can continue making billions of dollars. It's ridiculous. And I, whoever's fault it is, whether it's Sinclair or the streaming services or whatever it is, the fact that they have not figured this out, it tells me And I've read the articles from Brad Townsend and Mark Cuban was on the ticket the other day and all these different things. 
I'm going to say it like I say when you're in a relationship, and I, and I think this is true, and this is true of anybody, especially when you're early on in a relationship and you first start dating somebody, maybe you've gone out one or two times, and you wonder why they don't text you back. You wonder why, oh, we were supposed to do something, but something came up. Here's the deal. If somebody wants to do something, they do it. If something is important to somebody, they do it. And I'm going to tell you right now, Cuban can say whatever he wants, and these organizations can say whatever you want. You're telling me you're just not that into me. You know, basically. We don't care enough to make it happen. We don't care enough to get it done. And they don't. And that's why, you know, I give them the side eye, man. Um, Because I'm like you. I'm, I'm I'm looking at the games how I'm looking at them. Uh, but I'm not doing anything extra. Right. I'm not spending any more money to do it. I, I looked into it, and I'm just like, dude, no. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm not spending another $90. Right. And I'm not going to get uh, any new equipment. I'm not going to switch anything. If anything, I'll tell you this, and I've mentioned this, now that college football season is over, there's a very good chance I'm just going to be done with YouTube TV, and I won't have a streaming television service because the only thing I ever watch on legit TV was sports. And if they can't right. figure this out, if billionaires can't come together and say, hey, man, we wanted to charge this much for a package. You guys aren't willing to pay it. Let's just make it this much so we can get it out there. Then I'm just going to I'm done because this is ridiculous to me. No, it is, man. And I, I um, you know, other cities have gone through this. So it's not just us in Dallas. Other cities are dealing with this. And it's just ridiculous, man. As much as communities give to the sports teams, the various sports teams, be it, uh, you know, through tax rebates and tax, you know, tax help and and all the money they pump into it. Then, you know, now Mark Cuban would tell you it's not our fault. It's the it's the uh, it's the network. It's the Sinclair thing. It's it's all these other people. But I'm like you, man. The customer doesn't care about that. Customer Mm -hmm. says solve the problem because we've been loyal to you and now you're not being loyal to us. Correct. And, and that's where we're at. And the point was going back to the beginning of this conversation with this Harden thing, the NBA is just not on my radar right now. And it's unfortunate because I would love to watch the Mavs. I like watching the Mavs. I love watching Luka, but I just don't have that option right now. And you're making me jump through all these hoops. And again, it's much like I said that they're telling me I'm just not that into you. I'm kind of saying that to them because if it was uber important to me, I would find a way to make it happen. But I'm kind of getting the sense that this is a relationship that's just not working out right now. So, hey, I sent you one text. You didn't respond. I've moved on. I was going to say it's a one sided relationship. And, um, you know, what happens is you're right in terms of you lose consciousness of them. Like I forgot they were playing last night. Right. And somebody something happened that reminded me that they were playing. And so I happened to check it out. But again, I told you I was doing some experimenting watching the game last night because I watch them through IPTV, uh, which we've talked about at ad nauseum before. But I was trying to figure out because sometimes when you try to watch them on there, the uh, I can't tell whether I don't think it's my Internet, but the, it'll stop and start and freeze and all yeah. this other stuff, which to, in essence makes it unwatchable. Well, last night was the first time it worked pretty well uh, during the game. So, but that's why I was watching on the Charlotte channel, (laughs) not not the Dallas channel. Uh, So we'll see how it goes the next time they play. But it's all why I got to do all this, man. Right? And why you and see, I call it extortion because you want to charge somebody ninety dollars for the package that has the Mavs in it. Mm -hmm. And I always wondered this as as a business: Are you better off? You know, like they got another package that's forty five or fifty dollars. Would you be better off if you had a hundred thousand people or a hundred people at fifty dollars as opposed to, you know, twenty people at ninety dollars? Yeah, because I don't know I'm what like the answer you. is. I've drawn the line in the sand, bro. But that's where I'm at, man. And that's why, and this goes back a ways because it's deeper than just, now for the Mavs, obviously it's this year because I would have watched a handful of Mavs games by now. The last one I saw was Christmas night because it was on national television. And it's one of those things, it's frustrating, it's unfortunate. But, and, and I was telling you this with the Harden thing, I don't know what it is and I don't know where it happened. But when I was younger, I was really into the NBA. Like when, when Jordan was playing and I was a kid, I mean, hell, I played basketball in high school. I used to love the NBA and watching basketball. And somewhere along the way, 
the NBA lost me with the style of play that started to become more and more popular. And I never got back into it as much because I found other things like my love for college football now is higher than it's ever been in in the last decade that has grown exponentially where I watch gobs of college football. I watch a lot of the NFL. I I probably watch more college football than I do of anything else. I, I watch more college football games than I do of NFL games. And, you know, I watch I would want to watch hockey, but I'm not going to be able to do that. It's been a really interesting thing. And here's the problem that sports is running into with things that happen like this for me. There's a lot, a lot of really good, high quality television programming available to me now. Oh, yeah, there is. And if I'm not being entertained by the sports product or you're making it too difficult for me to find and get a hold of, guess what I can do? I can go to Netflix and bend on a show that they put out a new one every week and they take care of me. Uh, I don't think you're the only person like that, bro. I mean, and it doesn't matter whether we're talking sports watching or movies or whatever. The 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 competition for the in it for um, for your dollar is incredible right now. And so any excuse you give people not to watch you or not to consume you, that ain't no positive, man. No, I mean, it's not a positive at all. No, and I don't know what it is. Look, I get I mean, the Harden trade is a massive deal in the NBA. It shifts the balance of power, assuming that it works and that Harden will get in shape and Kyrie will show up. Assuming that that can happen, then you've got three of the top 20, 25 players in the NBA for sure on one team. And maybe they've recreated Golden State. Do you even need a lot of depth? I mean, if those guys are healthy, it doesn't matter. I don't know that Harden can coexist with everybody. Who knows? Maybe he can. It. it Houston got an unbelievable, they basically own anybody Brooklyn would have wanted in the draft for the next decade is theirs (laughs) with the amount of draft picks that they were just sent over. And it's not like Houston is going to suck. I mean, they've redone some things. Oladipo can play. I mean, he's an all-star a couple of years ago. You've got him. You've got John Wall, if they can figure that out with Boogie. Who knows, man? But for whatever reason, I just... And we were talking about this, and you like the drama of the NBA. And honestly, I think that's part of the reason why I don't like it as much. Oh, I, I've, I, you know, I, I said it's, um, it's the NBA is probably just behind the NFL to be my second favorite sport because college football is my favorite sport as a uh, as a fan, sports fan. But I, I like all the drama and all the storylines and and all the stuff that that goes on in the league. But I like it because it, it usually involves the 10 best players in the league. There's always something going on. And uh, I, I just kind of like that, man. But I also like it because I've told y'all on numerous occasions that I'm a guy who gets off on greatness. I really love watching people who are great at what they do do their thing. And the NBA has just got some fantastically talented, great players and I just love watching them play, man, because when KD is is on, there's nothing you can do about it. And then in the playoffs, when the best of the best are matched up, it's my favorite thing. Yeah, and I don't know. I mean, again, if the Mavs are, are around, I'll, I'm in. And to your point, like I, I have found myself, not this year, but if they were on national TV and there's nothing else going on, that's the thing, then maybe I would stop down and watch Giannis because he is dominant right. in a way that nobody else is really dominant like that in the NBA. I mean, other than LeBron. I mean, everybody can always enjoy watching LeBron, I feel like. I don't know what it is. I mean, that's I think that was part of the problem is when when it, when they went to that era of the NBA that was a decade ago or not that long yeah. maybe isolation yeah balls. when they when they when, when they went to isolation I I was like well, that I, was boring right and I hated watching it and that's when some of these other things started coming around and so it pulled my interest away and really it, it's been kind of hard for me to go back but now I lo- like Luca. The way he distributes and gets everybody involved, and really the Warriors were were big on that, you know, where yeah. everybody could do something. That's more of what I like watching, but it's still weird to me because now there are times where it feels like, okay, well, how many three-pointers can we shoot? Well, see, I was going to say they have to be very careful to me. It's just your boy now that they don't become baseball where there's, you know, you got your home run, you strike out, your walk. It's three outcome sport. You got to be careful that you're not just a dunk in a three-pointer and a free-throw sport. Um, that, you know, you still have all the elements of regular basketball involved and that it looks like the game, to some degree, that we grew up watching. And I think, uh, you know, the level of guys who can handle the ball and do all that stuff kind of lends itself to that. But you got to be careful, man, because nobody wants to see 
some team missed 43 pointers in a right. game. And then that becomes a thing where, and I don't know, I mean, and this is where I start feeling like when I have these conversations, like, my God, I, I'm in my 40s and, I, and I'm stuck in some of my ways and holy shit, you know, but it really is one of those things where I'll go back to him like, man, when I grew up playing basketball, we didn't play that way. <laughs> Dude, you, you're going there? No, but that's the thing is that sometimes I see these shots and, and I get it. I get, and baseball's getting this way too, man, where the analytics of certain things are destroying sports. Where, hey, if we jack up 53 pointers, if we hit a high enough percentage of them, long term, it's better off than if I pass up this stupid three point shot for the guy standing under the basket wide open for a layup. Correct. And in your brain, when you're watching that, you go, my God, the dude's wide open. Pass it to him. But no, analytically, we need to continue missing these three point shots, because as long as we hit 35 percent of them, we're going to score 120 points and win. And it's doing it. Baseball screwed, man. And it, it, like if baseball doesn't come together and say we've got to change something, they're completely screwed. Well, you know what we're talking about now because I got no use for baseball. Like I'm out on baseball. Right. And, and baseball is a sport that at my core I love. But there are times now watching the game where I'm, it, it's like watching ISO basketball. I'm, I'm sitting there going, what am I watching? What is this? It's so incredibly boring. It doesn't help that the Rangers got a bad team right now. Right, that it's doesn't help. A, it's just a boring sport. Because like I always tell you, all right, you know, if because um, I think this matters. If you're going to spend your money watching the Cowboys, what do you, who are you watching? You're watching Dak, you know, uh, at least you used to watch Zeke. You're watching Amari, you're watching CeeDee Lamb. Perhaps you're watching Tank. There's a few cats there you may be watching. If you're watching the Mavericks, you're there to see Luca and the Unicorn. And yeah. Everything else is is cool. And you know, if you if you're watching the stars, at one point you're watching Jamie Benn, maybe you're watching Taylor Tyler Sagan, maybe you're watching Heskin and now. But at least you got a couple guys to watch or a couple names to watch. Who are you watching for the Rangers? You got Joey Gallo, but Joey Gallo went back to being a 195, 200 hitter last year. Yeah, outside of that, you're just hoping for some of these young guys to do something. And then what are you hoping that they do? You know what they're hoping that you do, that they do? Literally, you're hoping that they walk or hit a home run. Because that's what baseball is now. It's sad, man. It's really, and that's where it goes back to the analytical conversation. And I get it. But at some points, I'm like, well, if we're going to do that, I'll just play video games. Yeah. I mean, it's. Where I can control no fun, it. Bro. Right. Because I can look at analytics and, and apply it to a video game. Because. And then I wonder, like, baseball's really getting to this point, and you're seeing that. That's why they hire certain managers and not other ones. They really literally want a guy who basically they punch in numbers and it says, in this situation, do this, but we need you to relay it to this guy so he knows in a way he understands. Well, you know, that's always been my problem with the – and we'll, we'll translate it to the, to the sport that we both love the most, you know, the NFL. That's, that's been my problem with analytics people in the NFL. Well, it's fourth and two. You should go for it. Well, dude, we've got 17 carries for 34 yards today. I don't know that today is the day to go for it on fourth and two. Right. Or fourth and one. On a day where, where we're gouging them, where our running back's good, where our line's blowing them off the ball, yeah, that's, this feels like a good spot to go for it, even if we're at our own 37. But they go, well, 71% probability will get it. What about that other 29%, bro? Yeah. <laughs> where if I don't get it? They go in for a touchdown. Now we're down 17 points and the game is essentially over. I mean, it just it's, it's not that cut and dry, man, because the game is still played by humans. And, you know, as the more I think about it, it might be one reason why Ron Washington will never get another job. Yeah, because he was the ultimate gut guy. You know, I mean, I always like to tell this story. I asked him one time why he sent a guy up to the plate. I can't remember who it was, but he you know, was struggling against left-handers and hadn't had a hit against left-handers in a while. And it was a key situation. And everybody was like, hey, you got a pinch hit right here. Why are they sending him up for the plate? So at the end of the game, after it's over, I sneak back around and say, yo, man, why you put your boy back up there again? Mm -hmm. He said, because his first two times at the plate, he may have even struck out or something. He was like, but he was in there. He looked good. He was aggressive. He was confident. And he didn't get a hit, but he had good at bats even though they didn't result in hit. And so I put him in there thinking, if he gets a hit, because he's had good at-bats today, in this situation against a lefty and help us win this game in the ninth inning, 
he might get cranked up and help us win seven, eight, and nine more ball games over the next two or three weeks. Now, I don't think that guy got to hit that third time up, but that's why he went against the analytics. And so if you're talking to somebody while you're trying to get a job today, you tell them that, they're like, man, we go by the book. We don't go by your gut. Yeah, that's that's part of what this whole thing is, I feel like. And, you know, it, it wraps into that giant encapsulating conversation about why I'm more into some things than others now for whatever reason that it may become and way to go. All these leagues and all these channels and all this whatever. It, it, it's really become that way. And it's, just, it's like this with anything, man. If you want somebody to know about you, you got to make it as easy as possible to get to, which is why with the podcast, we created these QR codes. So when we're out and about, if you don't know how, how to subscribe, you just scan the QR code. It takes you right there. You click one button. I don't go, oh, oh, so you're using Apple Podcasts? Oh, yeah. Well, we're not on that one. So what you need to do is if you can go over here and do this, and then once you're at that site, what you do is you go this way. People are like, what, what are you talking about? I'm not doing that. Right, right, right. But yet, that's what I feel like Cuban or Fox Sports Southwest, Sinclair, whatever it is, somewhere along the way is asking us to do. And it sucks, man, because I would like to be able to watch Luka Doncic on a more nightly basis. I feel you. So, Matt, I had the thing that you never want to have happen to you happen to me the other day. Okay. It happened to the lovely Lorraine. You know, she's a real estate agent. And so she asked me, she said, there's an ad for a car on my on my business page on Facebook. I go, well, you didn't put it there. She goes, no. And so you look at it and it's a uh, somebody has hijacked her account on Facebook. Really? Dude. And when I say hijacked it, I don't know how they did it, but they took it over. And so they placed this ad for some. It was like a 1999 truck. It was a good looking truck, but it's a truck. And it was said it was for like $800, which didn't make sense because it looked like it was worth far more than that. But she couldn't figure out how to, I was like, well, the first thing you got to do is you got to change your passwords. And so she was trying to do that. And dude, when I tell you her phone rang all day yesterday with people trying to get this truck, because they worked it through some kind of Facebook marketplace. Thing. What? So it went to a bunch of people. And even though she put on the ad, this is a scam, blah, 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 yeah. blah. Her phone was ringing nonstop yesterday with people trying to buy this truck. And so, but you're trying to figure out, they took over the entire page. So you got to get them off their page, you know, blah, blah, blah. So it's very frustrating because, you know, you got to deal with these people calling Mm -hmm. and you've, and it's like somebody breaking in your house. You feel violated because you don't really know how they did it and you don't know what else that they've done. Well, the other shoe just dropped. She just looked at her real estate banking account. Well, it's missing eight hundred dollars. What? Yeah, because they figured out how to get in there. Jesus. And so you know, you call the bank and you say, "Hey, this is fraud and blah blah blah," and they right. can double check it to make sure that you're telling the truth and stuff. But you know, the other thing is, your initial reaction is, "Okay, that's a business account, and you keep a certain amount of money in there for her business stuff mm-hmm. she's got to do." But if they got access, if they've got access to that account, if, uh, are they wheel, moving around to the other accounts, which has our real money in there? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And because you can get the money back, but okay, how long does it take to get the money back? And how does that handicap you while you're trying to get the money back? So, dude, this is the uh, this is the worst scenario, worst possible scenario. And, uh, you know, they did this to my father on Instagram probably about six months ago, like created an entire fake account with him on there and uh, with his face and everything. And it was just an entire fake account. And they were going around asking other family members for money. OK, so that's the point of doing that, because my, my question was, you know, obviously they figured out how to hack into the business account or whatever, but. My initial question was, what would be the benefit of them posting an ad for a truck and she gets the phone calls? Like, what's their benefit out of it? Right. I don't know. Maybe, I, don't, I don't know. Maybe they were. No, I think they were trying to get people. They probably set up something so that if you did it through Facebook or, or Marketplace and tried uh, to actually do the sale, then it, okay, then then it, it went it, to their account. That makes sense. Because um, I had somebody take over my, my aunt's account on Facebook and the next thing I knew um they had created a cash app thing and she sent me she sent me a cash app that said hey 
Will you send me a hundred dollars? And I knew it was a fake because she's not one of those aunts who would ask me for a hundred dollars because she lives in DC and she it just, she would just never do it. And so I knew it was a fake. So I called her son and he looked into it and sure enough, it was a fake, but dude, these people, you know, doing all this cyber crime, mm-hmm. it is the biggest pain in the ass ever. Yeah. That's, that's on another level, man. That's that it's, you got to watch out for that and be cognizant. And we get a lot of people, especially in our jam session cast Instagram that will randomly message us. And I always like screwing with these people because it'll be one of those things like, Hey, how are you? And I'm like, good. How are you? And they're like, Oh, I'm looking for a true love or something. What do you do? And I'm like, okay, you obviously don't have any idea who we are since it's blatantly obvious. <laughs> if you read any of our information, what this is. So then I'll always make up something like totally random to tell them something that I do. You know, I've used where I work at the zoo and I manually masturbate caged animals for artificial insemination. (laughs) And they're like, oh, that sounds like fun. And I go, yeah, it's rough, but somebody's got to do it. Wow. You know, where you just mess with people like that. It's the same thing as like telemarketers and all that, like back in the day and how I used to message and all that. I mean, it's one of those things. I remember when I was in, I might've told this story before when I was in college one time Until my mom, I realized, okay, my mom, this is back when people had answering machines. And my, if you called my door, my answering machine at one point, it would pick up and it'd be like, hi, you've reached Matt and Tucker, who is my roommate's name. We're not here right now, but while we have your intention, have you considered how important it is to give yourself a testicular exam? First, grab the (laughs) testicle between your thumb and forefinger. And I would, I found this pamphlet on it and I read like how to give yourself an exam for testicular cancer and stuff. And that was my answering machine. (laughs) Wow. I don't know why, just because I thought, I mean, no wonder people thought I was crazy weirdo. Huh? <laughs> yeah, bro. That's what I'm dealing with. Cyber crime today. Cyber crime is rough, man. And as we wrap up the podcast here on this version, we close it out with another episode. Not the whole thing, just the sip. We will sample three craft beers here brought to you by our friends at Beer Geeks Shop in downtown Rockwall. I was over there just the other day. Talk to Deidre for a bit. Always such a phenomenal selection. They're always getting in new arrivals. They have over 400 craft beers. Everything in the store is available in singles. And I'll tell you this, she actually she sold out of the Jam Session six pack. So I got to remember, I was telling her we need to come up with some new beers and start a new six pack. So be looking for that. Make sure you're following everybody on social media, Jam Session Cast on Instagram or Beer Geek Shop on Instagram for whenever we launch the new Jam Session six pack. But Jason and Deidre, man, they're good people. It's a local family owned business out there in Rockwall. So get out and support them. But today, a very interesting beer journey that we are about to go on here. Now, I rarely ever drink international beers just because there's a lot of. Right. And there's a lot of super high quality stuff being made in America, obviously. And and I tend to pick American. But this is it, it. This might actually be the first craft brewery from Mexico that we've done on the show. I believe it is. It is Cerveceria Monstruo de Agua. Cerveceria Monstruo de Agua. Which essentially is monster water. And that is the name of the place. Sugoi is the name of this beer. It is a 5% beer, and it just says it's an ale brewed with agave, ginger, and lemongrass, which sounds really interesting. And I've never had this before, so obviously... It to me because of that. I am very interested in, in checking this one out. A brewery, and believe it or not, it is true, Mexico does have a very small number of actual craft breweries. And this obviously would would count as one of those. So I find this very, very interesting here to check out. And I would imagine that this is just a really light blonde type style beer that is going to give you the flavors that it says on the bottle. So agave, obviously, of course, is going to come off as a little sweeter. And then with the lemongrass and the ginger should be a a nicely mixed beer. That's grass made from a lemon. (laughs) Really? No. No, it's not really grass made from a lemon, but lemongrass, you know, that's one of those healthy things where they put it in tea and you take like a shot of lemongrass or whatever. And lemongrass is basically just like a 
a type of grass. I mean, it's just it's a a grass. <laughs> So lemongrass is a type of grass. Yeah, I mean, it grows. It, it's, it's pretty clear. It's got that. I smell a little bit of lemon in there. Yeah, it, it grows like the longer type. It almost looks like a longer weed, and, and it's got that flavor in it. And, you know, it's like a lemony zing, I guess you could say. You know, I kind of taste it in there, too. It's got kind of that zing mm-hmm. thing. Um, you know, Mexican lager, you can, y'all know me. It's uh, It's got a bit of flavor in it, not enough to hide mm. that beer yeasty taste. Yeah, that's interesting, man. That is an interesting one. That That is... I could see why people would huh. like that. I don't really like it, but I could see why people would. Because um, it's got some more flavor, but uh, I don't know. It's not... You know what it is, man? It's too much lemongrass. Yeah, it's... it's it. Yeah, it's interesting. It's very light. And it... Huh. That's an interesting one. That is a light beer with a lot of... See, I get the ginger in it as well, and I definitely get the lemongrass, of course, coming through, but... Yeah, that that's, you know, I don't know what I was expecting from a craft brewery from Mexico, but I, I would say that that is solid. I don't love it and I don't hate it. It's somewhere in the middle. No, that's a good way to describe it. That's a very good way to describe it. That's why I said what I said. It's not like it was bad. Right. But it's just like, meh, meh, meh for me. Yeah, meh for you. And again, that is from Cerveceria Monstruo de Agua from Coahatamoc, Cuarataro, Mexico. Yeah. That place. That's the name of the area that it's from. So let's move on from that one to a beer. And this is a really, really good one here. This is from Modern Times Brewing, which showed up in Texas uh, basically in the middle of last year. And Modern Times is a really cool place out of California. They're doing some really good stuff. They have some really good uh, hazy IPAs and, and different style of IPAs that they do. But this is called Fruitlands, which is a, as it tells you on the can, a sour tropical fruit goza. Now, obviously, any goza is going to be a little bit sour and tart. A true goza, as we have talked about before, comes from Goslar, Germany, and is actually made with a little bit of salt in it. So you get a little bit of saltiness on most gozas. If they're done correctly, the, the salt will definitely come through on this. And go ahead and crack that open. I thought this was a really good one. It's you, you get the tartness that you're looking for in a Goza. You get a little bit of the fruit. You, you can get the salt definitely coming through. And then the passion fruit and guava, which kind of gives you a, a nice tropical kick. I was going to say it's the passion fruit that uh, that I'm interested in, in seeing if that uh, if that comes through. Plus, I want to taste the uh, I want to taste the salt. You should taste it. You should taste it because get it. Yeah, so on this one, on the sip here, and again, this is Fruitlands from Modern Times Beer. This is one to me, the passion fruit and guava are right there. They're they're coming through nice. And and on the back, man, that's a solid salt end on on the finish there. Yeah. Woo. Yeah. (laughs) That's a solid (laughs) salt end. And it is tart. Yeah. And so I believe this falls into the category of, hmm. Exactly what it's supposed to be. Not too tasty for your boy. Yeah, man. This is for those that are looking for the style uh, of I goza. Just took another, I just took another sip. And, uh, man, this. But this is if you like gozas, this wow. is what the style to me. Now, obviously, this one's got a lot of fruit to yeah. kick in it, but this is what the style of goza is supposed to be because it is quite tart and it is really? salty, and that's what this is supposed to be. This is actually uh, a really good representation of the style. I've had some gozas that weren't sour and salty. Yeah, and that's why, like, some of those I have, and I'm like, okay, I mean, look, if you want to make a sour, make a sour. If you want to make a Berliner Weiss, make a Berliner. If you want to make a Goza, it's got to have salt in it. Otherwise, what are you doing? Okay. All right. Now, see, I've I've just, and see, that's why you like to talk to Matt about beer, because he just broke that down the the proper way. Because I was going to tell him, I had a Margarita Goza from Red Gap Brewer, and that wasn't salty and tart. Yeah, and, uh, and, and and that was one that I thought should have been a little bit more <laughs> should salt. Should a little bit more salty. You know, and a little- right. And, and it's just, there's different ways of doing it. If you're looking for something locally, Three Nations has a Goza. When they put theirs out, just their base goes is phenomenal. I mean, you talk about the way a Goza is supposed to be true to the style where it's light, it's refreshing, it's tart, and it has some salt on the back, then, you know, that's a really good one. In modern times, I mean, yeah, the passion fruit and guava come through, but the tartness and salt is there. This is what it's supposed to be. They did good on this. And I got to say, Matt, you got to really be impressed that I pulled up a margarita gosa from where you got to compare it to. I mean, you really should be. 
Yeah, that's true. I am. Well done. So let's move on to a our final beer here in just a sip Ooh. from Beer Geek Shop. All these beers, by the way, are available at Beer Geek Shop. You can get them in the singles. You can try any of these beers by itself if you'd like. Let's go to our friends from 512. Obviously, that is an Austin area uh, brewing company. And this is their Nut Brown, which is an English style brown ale. And the English style brown ales usually tend to be most English beers are always this way. They're maltier and a little bit sweeter and will probably be a little bit of a fuller kind of mouth on it than you would get from the American brown ales. But brown ales are one of those styles. I'm curious if you like this, because as you've gotten into scotch ales and you like stouts and the coffee and the porter, you know, brown ales are not as roasty. They tend to be a, a tinge sweeter because of the nut roast and, and, and all that that goes into the way they make these. But uh, if you can get a good brown ale, man, they can be light and very drinkable. And as you can see, yeah, this one pours. I mean, it's brown. <laughs> so what do you think? I don't know. I don't know that I like how it smells. Yeah, they're, they're definitely interesting. But, the, <laughs> but I'll see what it tastes like. Because they're not as roasty. I mean, it, it, these come across as, as like almost a little drier, but you get like nutty characteristics in it. If you, Yeah, that's not uh, yeah. that's not bad. And they got that's a lot of flavor on. with a little bit of roast, but not as much as you would get from some of the other styles. Yeah. No, that's, um, I kind of like that one. That one's too bad. I was, uh, now that I tasted it, because I wasn't sure what to expect, because I wasn't expecting kind of like a roasty coffee thing. Right. But that's kind of what it tastes a little bit. Yeah, you get a little bit of that roast in there. It's a little sweet. Why is that? That's just from the malts, the malts that they use in in building the base on this. Is there some kind of coffee malt? Because it feels like it tastes a little coffee. I mean, I don't know particularly what what malts they're using in this one, but I would imagine it's just the malt that they put into it and how they use it is probably a roasted malt and maybe a darker malt like roasted barley, I would guess, is probably thrown into this, which gives it. I was trying to read on the bottle to see if it said what it was supposed to be. So, yeah, but this is good. You know, th- this is no, one this of those is, styles is, that, that uh, comes through really style. nicely. Yeah. And this is what happens when you hang out with Matt and you hang out with beer geeks and you try some different stuff. Uh, because that, w- that was pretty solid right there, Matt, to steal, steal one of your phrases. Yeah, see, I thought you might, like, you might like this just because of the types of beers that you tend to be into that you've kind of started to explore a little bit more where you get these types of flavors Right, they're in the same flavor genre, probably. Right, and, and and this is, like, browns are usually not a huge thing for me, but again, this is a smooth beer, a nice, slightly dry finish, but it, the light roast comes through without being as roasty as coffee stouts or a porter or something like that. No, 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 this was, this was solid. It gets more solid by the minute. Well, good, I'm glad you're enjoying it. And there you have it again, our three beers today, our first ever beer from a Mexican craft brewery. Monstruo de Agua, we had the Segoy. Hope it's the last. <laughs> and we had <laughs> Modern Times Beer from out in San Diego, California. Fruitlands is the name of the Goza that we tried. And then from right here in Texas, down in Austin, 512 Brewing Company's Nut Brown English Style Brown Ale. All three available at Beer Geeks Shop in downtown Rockwall. All available in singles. So get by, support local, drink local. And check out some really cool craft beers. There you go. That's going to wrap it up for us, man. Thanks for listening once again to the Jam Session Podcast. Check out our YouTube channel, Jam Session Podcast. Find us on Twitter at McMatt Radio at JJT underscore journalist. Thanks to Purple Elephant Music for the music you hear right now at the end. And of course, at the very beginning of each episode. He is the radio and TV star, the sexy Jean-Jacques Taylor. And I'm just a guy, Matt McLaren. Remember to subscribe and rate and review the podcast. Tell your friends as we continue to grow this together. And we'll catch you next time available everywhere you listen to podcasts.